Uh, please be seated. President, Vice President, Past Presidents, Members of Council, Deans, Members, Fellows, Distinguished Guests, it's a genuine pleasure to welcome you all back to RCSI for this splendid occasion, the 97th Abraham Collis Lecture. And it gives me pleasure to invite the President of the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland, Professor Ronan O'Connell, to introduce this evening's Abraham Collis Lecture. Vice President, past presidents, members of council, dean, it's a great pleasure to welcome you back for this, the 97th Collis Lecture. Usually we have to do a little bit of introduction for our Collis Lecture, but I'm afraid John Alverdi has already induced, introduced himself with a wonderful contribution uh, to the uh, last session. But I am truly delighted that John has agreed uh, to give this uh, lecture. Uh, I have heard him speak on many occasions, and he speaks on a topic that I think is of profound interest uh, to all of us engaged in abdominal surgery, and increasingly, I think, the, as you'll hear, the microbiome is of relevance to the, all disciplines of surgery where there is a surgical insult. The Collis Lecture is the most prestigious lecture uh, that can be uh, awarded by this uh, college, and so it is a great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, our 97th Collis Lecture, uh, John Alverdi. John. Thank you, President O'Connell and Vice President Vianney uh, for this uh, very prestigious and great honor to speak to all of you today. Um, I could be, not be more delighted. This is obviously a career high for me to be here in Ireland at the Royal College uh, uh, of Surgeons in Ireland. It's, it's a great honor, a great privilege, and I thank you for the uh, privilege of this podium. Um, Abraham Collis was obviously a great, a brilliant man uh, who did many amazing things, and I think he would be proud of this lecture uh, were he able to hear it. This is my disclosure, and I'll speak to a little bit about the product that this uh, company has generated at the end. And I want to talk to you about the role of the microbiome in surgical site infections, despite all measures that we have now in the current asepsis episode that, uh, is in, uh, that involves all of our patients. Surgical site infections remain a clear and present danger to patients, whether they're superficial, deep organ space infections or include anastomotic leak. Uh, the presumptive e etiology is that there are some type of breach and sterile technique that occurs or some type of um, intraoperative contamination event. And therefore, all uh, current and future recommendations are more sterility measures and broader antibiotic coverage. Unfortunately, these are not evolutionarily stable strategies. Uh, I stole this line from Richard Dawkins' book uh, on the selfish gene, which I read a long time ago. And I mean that because we're now seeing that over half of the pathogens causing surgical site infections are actually resistant to this uh, idea of a one-size-fits-all standard antibiotic regimen, at least in the United States, and I'm sure, and I know this is happening in Europe also. And here's, all, here's a quote, a direct quote from Neil Hyman, who is a chief of colorectal surgery at the University of Chicago. He said, if direct bacterial contamination is the cause of most SSIs, why then can you create a colostomy and not cause an SSI all the time? So it does seem somewhat of a paradox. And I think the theme here is that if we want to get towards zero, I don't know that we can get to zero, but move the needle from where we are, which is in a good place, to zero, we have to dispel this notion that if some is good, more is better. And I looked at this very carefully when I wrote this paper in Lancet Infectious Disease, and I discovered that in the majority of cases, routine wound cultures from the operative field during surgery do not match the pathogens cultured from a subsequent SSI. 
And this slide represents 25 years of work from my laboratory. And it basically explains the paradox in this way. Clinical infection does not develop from a one-time contamination event, but rather occurs from a series of complex molecular interactions. So operative trauma itself releases these cues, chemokines, cytokines, that bacteria recognize, and they release their own signals that go back to the host in a bi-directional inter-kingdom signal exchange. Bacteria do this also. They live in colonies. It's not a single bacteria. It takes a village. And you end up with this matchless web of dense dynamic interactions that are unique to and dependent on the environmental context. So when you think of virulence or harmfulness or clinical infection, it's neither a sole property of the pathogen nor that of the host, but rather it is a property of their interaction. And so one way to explain this paradox is context-dependent virulence expression. That is, bacterial activating cues, not bacterial contamination itself, predicts vulnerability to infection. Of course, you cannot have a wound infection without bacteria. So bacteria are necessary, but alone not sufficient to cause a wound infection. More has to happen. And the market assumption is these are all due to some type of intraoperative contamination event. That thing on the left is, is chlorhexidine gluconate that this company wants you to spray in the wound. Wound protectors, at least in pancreatic oduodenectomy, have not been shown to be um, uh, reduced surgical site infections. This study, by taking collagen, uh, genomycin sponge, and, and, and dipping it into the wound and closing the wound with it, uh, actually increased uh, wound infection rates. Uh, and that was published in the New England Journal. And then this contraption on the right, you put it in the operative field and it sucks particulate matter out of the operative field. It doesn't work. But so people have resorted to more antibiotics, which I told you is not an evolutionarily stable strategy, both in pancreatic oduodenectomy and in colectomy. And the problem is more sterility and broader antibiotic use are not evolutionarily stable strategies. The same thing happens with an astomotic leak. Everything is designed at devices. And currently, we're in love with this technology, ICG, which we heard about uh, earlier today. Uh, but in randomized control trials, it doesn't actually reduce an astomotic leak rates. I'm fine with using it. It's just another tool. But to actually ask the question in a rigorous clinical trial, does it prevent leak rates? It doesn't. I'd personally rather just go to a very experienced surgeon. And here's a contraption that was tried putting a condom around the anastomosis to divert stool away from it. It doubled the uh, leak rate. And we've got these things happening now. Sensors and you know devices to avoid the ileostomy, they don't work. But they're, again, they're based on the fact that there must be some mechanical basis to this. And so this idea that mechanical approaches enhance anastomotic integrity, this approach has resulted in abject failure. Yet we keep trying. So today I hope to convince you that anastomotic leaks are a problem of biology, not physics. And surgical site infections develop beyond the simple notion of intraoperative contamination, and that we can manipulate the gut microbiome to reduce postoperative infection-related complications because most SSIs originate from properties expressed by the gut microbiota as they or it, depending on how you define that as a single or a plural noun, interact with the host. So in 2012, I sent this uh, review uh, after I had read a bunch of articles on it and had this notion and I had a resident come to me and say, I want to go to colorectal surgery and I want to do something. I said, let's write this review before we start. And she wrote this uh, very beautiful review and it got immediately rejected with this. Bacteria cannot possibly cause leaks because they are there all the time. So part of that review had this man's work. 1955, two years after I was born, Isidore Cohen is an iconic American surgical figure, and he uh, used dogs where he devascularized the uh, transverse colon in a segment, put a catheter in there where he then infused tetracycline or saline directly in the intestine. 
there was no difference in the stool microbiota by culture back in 1955. And this is what he found, which is probably no surprise to anybody here. None of us would close the abdomen with a piece of colon that looked like that. But what was surprising was that antibiotics delivered right to the site of the anastomosis actually reversed the ischemia and prevented leak in this model. Does this prove that microbes cause leaks? Here's another study, now 20 years later, 1975, and this group from New York pretty much did the same dog model. Devascularize the transverse colon, make an anastomosis, but they used tensile strength as their readout. And they gave erythromycin or canamycin orally for one day post-op, and they observed a 20% increase over controls in the group that received the oral antibiotic. If you do it for three days, you get a 50% increase in tensile strength. Assumably, that is more collagen deposition in the wound, greater strength in that wound. If you do it for six days, oral erythromycin and canamycin, you get a 70% increase in tensile strength. Now, they didn't have the molecular tools to tease out the details of how this worked, but it was pretty powerful. And it seems inescapable at this point that bacteria somehow influence anastomotic healing. So we did this with Ben Shogan and a bunch of other really brilliant people in my laboratory where we realized that we had to create um, sort of unambiguous, uncontestable, uh, uh, uncontestable molecular evidence that an anastomosis could be disrupted by bacteria alone. And uh, I write in here that even uncontestable evidence may not change a surgeon's worldview. There are still people that don't believe this. And you know, a hypothesis is not to be believed. It is to be tested, and it needs to be formally tested. But this is what we hypothesized and proved, that these inflammatory signals from a large tumor, you know, they are released, they activate collagenolytic bacteria, bacteria that make the enzyme collagenase, efficalis or pseudomonas, to adhere and to, to release these enzymes. And these enzymes do two things. They directly disrupt the wound, or they activate MMP9, metal metalloprotease 9, from its inactive to its active form. And you end up with supra-physiologic protease activity, which is the hallmark of all abnormal healing. And remember that collagen strength is a function of remodeling which is a continuous process of synthesis and degradation. You synthesize some protein, then you break it down, you get those strong disulfide bridges, and the collagen matures. That's called remodeling, and it gets strong. So these two organisms were the focus initially of what we did. And when we disabled collagenase, the collagenase gene at Efecalus, none of these mice leaked. Now, you might say, listen, Elverity, I operate on people, not rodents and dogs. I get that, and it's true. But remember that 100% of these animals have efficalis on their anastomotic tissues. Bacteria are there all the time, but molecularly in the placebo group, and medical students and residents do these operations, you never get a leak. But only when you are colonized by collagenase positive efficalis or pseudomonas do you leak, and it takes a lot to do it. Most leaks are subclinical. You can see there you got bowel stuck to it, and if you pull that off, there's a hole there. Only 10% have a clinically significant leak, and uh, you know these are what we call an abscess or peritonitis in these mice, and that's only 5% of the animals. And so we don't differentiate between a dehiscence and a leak because we only know about leaks when they clinically develop. So in vivo bacterial phenotype expression, a property unique to the environmental context drives this pathogenesis, and that is surgical injury stress. And if you have, if you are whipplers in this audience, you do these kind of operations, the same thing's happening here. This is right out of the pathogen playbook. I'm gonna make an enzyme that eats to that tissue, and I'm gonna drive a enzyme that the body normally uses as a protease, and I'm going to drive it to superphysiologic levels and disrupt the thing that you sewed together. And there's a blind spot here because these two organisms, which are very frequent, are not eliminated currently by the one-size-fits-all antibiotics that we use. 
So we need to know this. You might say, well, who cares? Probably all anastomoses leak a little, as long as they seal and the patient remains asymptomatic. You know, don't call me on a Friday at 4 o'clock in the afternoon because there's an ugly CAT scan. Just, you know, leave it alone. But if you, if you don't know this, how are you going to know this? Look, who cares? Not everything heals perfectly every time. As long as things seal and the patient remains asymptomatic, we don't need to know this. But if you don't know this, how are you going to prevent this? Look, first of all, this is rare and it's going down. Just avoid failure to rescue, be vigilant, follow up phone calls, early CT, percutaneous drainage, etc. But these problems still exist and they're problematic. About 1,500 people a year in the United States will die of an anastomotic leak. Is waiting for a patient to clinically manifest a leak the best we can do? I don't think so. So Neil Hyman and I did this study where we examined anastomotic healing by looking at different time points in the healing process. And we literally took 10 patients, scoped them in the operating room, brought them back you know, before they went home and looked, took pictures, did an anastomotic lavage, and did a bunch of uh, immune assays. And we can image analyze the anastomosis and lavage those tissues for sample analysis. Now, here's what you see in the operating room, if, whether you do ICG or not. It looks good. It should look good if you're a conscientious colorectal surgeon or an esophageal surgeon when you look in the esophagus. It should look perfect. Nobody leaves the OR when it doesn't look perfect. But let me just tell you, it doesn't look so good on day three to five, especially if you've had neoadjuvant chemo RT. And you could say the top, the bottom one actually looks worse off than the top one. The top one had a high growth of collagenase, uh, collagenase producing enterococci. The bottom one had none. The top one, the patient went home in 10 days, came back on day 24 with a large abscess. It was a leak. And this patient, he went on to heal perfectly. So looks can be deceiving, and they're insufficient, and it begs the question if the microbiota influence healing. Now, these studies were not powered to understand the positive predictive value of looking at collagenolytic bacteria and the cytokines and chemokines that are released. But without this information, all approaches are simply empiricism ad absurdum, and we need to know this. So how are we going to modulate microbiota? Well, you can give a fecal transplant. That's been talked about. It's messy and it's dangerous. You can give a one-size-fits-all crapsule. There are about 50 to 100 startup companies saying, if you take this capsule, you'll grow hair, you'll live to be 150, and nothing bad will happen to your body. They make claims that are pretty outrageous. And probiotics don't really work yet in surgery. A lot of people take them. A lot of surgeons give them. But a high-fiber, low-fat, plant-based diet does work. And the problem with this modeling is, I've learned over the years, that rodents eat a diet that, that is way too healthy. It's a plant-based, high-fiber, low-fat diet. I mean, why are we modeling human disease with, with, with mouse chow or rat chow? Makes no sense. So we're learning that food, environment, microbiome, metabolites that they make drives recovery. And everything you eat and every drug you take goes through your microbiome, and they make metabolites that are really important to drive health. Now, I found this on the internet, traditional Irish breakfast meats. And I had breakfast this morning. It was delicious. And I had a full Irish breakfast. I still don't know uh, what Tommy Maloney meats are. Um, uh, but it's still not as bad as the American diet. At least there's some beans there and some you know, tomatoes. In between the eggs and the hash browns, there is a fried pork chop, bacon, a stack of pancakes, and butter. Now, I learned what bangers are by going on the internet. It turns out that bangers came from World War I, the, the term, because the soldiers would stuff and make their own sausage, and they'd put it on the grill with anything they could find, and they'd explode. Um, but I've had them, and they're delicious. And so what we did is we said, well, let's give mice a high-fat diet and give them some antibiotics and then redo these surgeries and see what happens. And holy smokes, those collagenolytic efecalis, they went up from 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 8. That's four orders of magnitude rise just eating this diet and getting exposed to a cephalo du jour. And it increased the incidence and severity of the abscess 
and an asthmatic leak up to 50%. And these were big abscesses and, and actual peritonitis up to 50%, just changing the diet and giving them some antibiotics. So then this man um, from Scotland came to the University of Chicago. I showed him the data, and he is the world's expert in human nutrition and the gut microbiome. And he gave a great talk. And I showed it to him, and he says, you can reverse this with just short term. He goes, two days, you'll turn that around, and the mice will be fine. I'm like, no, that can't possibly work. It worked. And he was absolutely correct. And we did the study published in BJS. And here's what we did. Six weeks of the high-fat diet, and then only two days before we operated did we give them a chow diet. And these animals are already hyperglycemic. They're already, you know, uh, have fatty livers, a lot of visceral fat. And you're like, this is never going to work. Well, it worked. Two days only of what I call chow prehab reduced the leak rates by 66%, and five days completely eliminated. And we figured out how to detect if the microbiome is ready for surgery. And it took very little time. So I think it's important for us to think about what our patients eat. And we're no good at it because we need our help from our dietitians. And I think it's going to make a big difference across a number of different domains. For example, surgical site infections. You're like, what does the gut have to do with, let's say, a hip operation? If SSIs do not develop from intraoperative contamination, where do they come from? Well, we noticed when we fed these mice a high-fat diet and gave them antibiotics that there were packets of bacteria in their deep in their crypts that could be taken up by immune cells that then silently travel post-operatively to the wound sites where they release their infectious payload. And so clinical infection occurs depending on the presence of bacterial activating cues. And Monica Krasilek, who's a colorectal surgeon trained at the Mayo Clinic, was in our program, spent two years in my lab. And she showed this by labeling GFP MRSA, putting it in the gut and getting it to stably colonize, and then operating on these animals. And she could show at each step along the way that those GFP-labeled MRSA found their way from the gut to the wound silently by traveling inside of a neutrophil. And that study was redone a couple years later in a different model using rats, ours was in mice, in an orthopedic model with our exact methodology. So we decided to do this in a little bit of a different way. We fed mice a high-fat diet, a Western diet, and we gave them antibiotics before and afterwards. We gave them oral and IV, maybe like we would do to our patients. They got a little chubby. They got hyperglycemic. They had a lot of fat in there. And then we did this. We did a, a back muscle injury model where we cut the skin, exposed the underlying muscle, burned it with a cautery in six little millimeter, one millimeter spots, and put a stitch in there of foro silk. And then closed the wound, put a tegderm on it, and looked at it 10 days later. Now keep in mind, when we swabbed that wound before we closed it, it was sterile. So whatever is going to be in there is going to get there not because of an intraoperative contamination event. And here's what we found. If you eat chow, now none of us eat chow, but it's plant-based, high fiber, low fat, low carbs, way too healthy to model human disease. You have a very low infection rate. If you give them antibiotics, it goes up a little bit and it's polymicrobial and because you, you kill all the staph with your cephalosporin and your uh, clindamycin. But here's the piece de resistance. If you give them a high fat diet, you now start to see a higher infection rate. And if you give them antibiotics, you see the worst infections. Skin dehiscence, deep abscess formation, inflammation, and it's due to these bacteria, enteric bacteria. So how did they get there? Well, you contaminated the wound when you closed it. They must have pooped in this cage or something. No. We checked for that. And then we did genetic sequencing, and we could show ASV means amplicon sequence variance, exact sequence variance. We could show that the bugs that were in the gut were the very ones that ended up in that wound. So for you non-believers, I said, you know, to the resident who did this, and, and Monica Krasilek did this also in her model that she published, I said, take the three most common bacteria, close that wound, and every day, 
go in there and swab it. Try to externally contaminate that wound, because maybe we think, well, wow, the patient's wound looked fine when they went home. They must have done something, took a shower, rubbed on it. I don't know what they did, because they come back often two or three weeks later with a wound infection. Like, what the heck? He did it. Very low wound infection rate. Those two outliers out of the 10, 80% of them didn't. That's in contrast to when you do a clinical microbial wound infection score that incorporates how it looks and what it grows. 80% get grossly infected at a very high score rate, 6, 8, 9, 10, in the group that just got a Western diet and antibiotics. These mice are eating chow, and we're externally contaminating them. So getting to zero, I'm almost done here. We're in a really good spot, SSI rates that are all-time low. But here's the problem that we have, and this has been talked about through, the, through this, uh, this lovely uh, symposium. We have an aging population, more complex surgery, et cetera. And I just want to mention that SSI rates may be on a Laffer curve. There's a lot of evidence for this. And who is, what is a Laffer curve, and who is Arthur Laffer? Well, he was an economist at the University of Chicago. And he drew this curve, and he said, you know, you can tax people, and the government will get more money. But you hit a certain point where they start sheltering their income, or they stop working. And tax revenue rate goes down. It's called the Laffer curve. It's an upside down U curve. And he wrote it on a napkin with Dick Cheney and Don Rumsfeld in 1970-something when the, the uh, Nixon administration was transitioning to the Ford administration. And the question is, is, is this happening now? Is more of the same the answer? And you're like, of course it is. We need more sterility. We got to follow those protocols. We got to mandate those across. I'm not sure. I threw this article up here to show you that at least in England, Great Britain, and Ireland, they did this wonderful study from Nottingham showing that only 5 to 20% of you routinely use oral antibiotic and purgative cleansing, despite most of you believing that it works. So, you know, this is a quote from Neil Hyman. Surgeons do not need to be right. They just need to be sure. Okay. So this is my last slide. We need to get towards zero, and we need to figure out what to do next. And we need to think about this and think about this and think about this, something beyond antibiotics, and we, we've been working on a product that we think does that. And then we probably need to look, learn, and discover. Again, I want to thank uh, President O'Connell for the privilege of this podium, uh, Vice President Viani for uh, this gracious hosting of this and, and presenting uh, the retirement and allowing me to present twice. And uh, thank you for this uh, gracious invitation to this beautiful country and this beautiful city. Thank you very much. Professor Alvardi, I, I forewarned the audience that they were going to be challenged by an outstanding uh, presentation, one that would uh, challenge all held views. And uh, now I think we're not only certain, but we're sure uh, that you're right. Uh, I, I just need to take shares in whatever uh, plant food I need to take uh, before I have my next operation. Uh, but it is truly extraordinary. Uh, the concept, and yet, once explained, it is self-evident. And I think that's one of the great beauties of the science that you've done. You've taken what is a really important clinical question, you've interrogated it, and your answers at the end are self-evident, and that's wonderful. So it gives me great pleasure to ask you to come forward and to give you the Collis Medal. Uh, Professor Cockle Kelly to bring the proceedings to a close.
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, for the benefit of our online audience, uh, that brings to a conclusion our day's events. Can I congratulate our president, Professor Ronan O'Connell, and the organizing committee uh, for organizing this wonderful day of meetings, topped off by an outstanding lecture. I think we can all agree. Um, my thanks to both our online audience and our in-person audience for joining us today. Um, great to see everybody back in RCSI. That concludes the formal proceedings. If I could ask our audience to be upstanding for the outward procession. Thank you very much.